my great pleasure to welcome you here tonight for the sixth annual Congliffe Memorial Lecture. Um, this annual lecture series was established in 2005 to celebrate the life of John Bell Congliffe, who was our first Professor of Economics uh, back in 1921. The Congliffe Memorial Lecture brings leading economists to Canterbury each year to provide a public lecture highlighting their recent work and, and more importantly, the relevance of that work to the broader business and political community. Tonight's Congliffe lecturer is Charles Plopp, the Edward S. Harkness Professor of Economics and Political Science at the California Institute of Technology, Caltech. Early in the 1970s, Professor Plopp began to explore the use of laboratory experimental techniques. His discoveries have led to the testing of many theories in ways that could never have been done using traditional field data. Today, the economics profession is experiencing an explosion in the application of laboratory experimental techniques. And we have here, in this building, uh, the New Zealand Experimental Economics Laboratory, which, is, uh, which, which houses our, our own group. Volumes of experimental papers are being published each year, and the number of laboratories is growing rapidly. The Caltech Laboratory that Professor Plott developed is a major facility and has served as a model for laboratory development throughout the world. Much of Professor Plott's research has focused on exploring ways of applying laboratory experimental techniques to complex policy issues. For example, the problem of allocating landing rights at a major airport. He was the first to apply such techniques to real-world policy issues like regulation, deregulation, and antitrust. He's worked on policies for the allocation of resources on the space station Freedom, the markets for emissions permits in Southern California, pricing the use of natural gas pipelines, auctioning the right to use railway tracks, and managing electric markets in California. Experimental methods provide an important and inexpensive means of weeding out and improving bad theory. By studying the decisions of individuals motivated by real money, within well-defined and controlled institutional, that is to say laboratory settings, it's possible to gain deep insights into theories of economics and political processes. General theories that cannot explain behavior in these simple controlled cases are not general theories, and once identified as such, can either be discarded or improved. In the laboratory, the degree of success can be assessed and the nature of failure is analyzed. Thus, the laboratory not only provides the foundations of science, but the foundations of complex field applications. As well as contributing to some of the most fundamental discoveries in economics and political science, Professor Plott's Caltech Laboratory has been a major producer of the technologies used in laboratory experimental methods worldwide, including the development of powerful networking tools and the internet technology for conducting large global experiments. Professor Plott is a member of the National Academy of Science, the American Academy of Arts and Science, and a fellow of the Econometric Society. He's a Guggenheim Fellow, a Fulbright Senior Scholar, and a Fellow of the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences. And he was recently elected a Distinguished Fellow of the American Economics Association. He holds a PhD in Economics from the University of Virginia, and a Master of Science and a Bachelor of Science from Oklahoma State University. Uh, please join me in welcoming our distinguished speaker tonight, Professor Plott. Well, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. The, uh, in addressing an audience like this, I'm uh, reminded of a, uh, a talk I gave not too long ago, in which many of my wife's friends attended. And of course, they had absolutely no interest whatsoever in <laughs> economics, but they were certainly interested in what I do. In what do you do for a living? And of course, when I posed that question to these people, well, they were just, they could see the smiles everywhere. And, but the answer is, is very, very simple. I do what I want to do. As an academic, I had this lecture, lecture, of being able to explore things that strike my curiosity. Uh, sometimes I end up with dead ends, sometimes I don't. But in many respects, the things you're going to see here are just the product of what happens when we are able 
to follow our research dictated by curiosity. Curiosity-driven <coughs> research frequently leads to applications. And so that's what we're going to talk about tonight. We're going to talk about some curiosity-driven research. I'll show you some fundamental principles of economics, how it, how it works. And, and so I'll just start with the questions. <coughs> I take it this is what the audience, many of the audience, is curious about, right? What is an economics experiment? What do you learn? But most importantly, what's it good for? Why bother, right? And the answer is going to be the answer that any experimentalist would give. So the, ex the experimental methods you see here are really no different from the experimental methods in physics, uh, laboratory methods anywhere. The, the plight and, and the worry of any experimentalist is that all this time and resources and, and, uh, res and uh, development that you've, uh, you've spent your life working on is absolutely worthless. Right? It's about some little something that no one cares about. So that's a, that's a problem with uh, curiosity-driven research. It can be. But I'm going to show you some, some positive results about what it's good for. Now, I'm going to start out just by economics, like what is an economics experiment? And I'll show you just a, a simple little example. And this simple little example actually is quite deep. So let's just take a look. And the question we'll ask is uh, about the invisible hand, about the efficient resource allocation. Now, all of you guys, every one of you have heard about the invisible hand. You've heard about demand and supply. You've heard that markets tend to find an equilibrium. You read about it in stock markets. If you're in finance, you've probably read 10 zillion stories about what causes a stock market to do this or that. If you're in antitrust, you've also seen a lot of stories about what causes industries to do this or that. So the real question one might have is, is there, does the invisible hand actually work? Is there really one? Can we see it? Now that's different from telling a story about it. Can we actually see it? And can we understand what makes it work? Now remember, this is a very deep idea. It's saying that if you allow people to go about their own thing, that these decentralized, dispassionate, other disregarding competition is going to lead the system to an efficient allocation. In other words, greediness, nastiness, etc., leads to a good outcome. That was kind of the, the message of Adam Smith. So the question we can ask is, do we really believe that? Right? That's one of the things that brought me to experimental economics. So I'll show you how I, that the question was originally posed. It's very simple. You start out with, in the room, like this room, and you pick a person and I would tell him, I'd say, look, I'm going to give you the right to buy one unit of this thing being sold. And you'd say, what is it? And I'd say, you don't care. If you buy a unit, you have to pay for it but you can resell it to me for $10. Another person, I make him the same deal, he not knowing what the deal I just made. So if he make, buys a unit, he pays for it, but he can resell it to me for $10. So now if he's rational, he is go not going to pay more than $10 for it. And if he's greedy, sorry, I'm sure that that's not the case, <laughs> but should he happen to be, he's not going to pay anything more from that for that than he has to. Right? So we have kind of the two elements. And if he's awake, kind of smart, he's going to look around and see what the competition looks like while he's doing that. So I'll go to another person and I'll say, look, if you buy a unit, you can resell it to me for maybe for eight dollars, someone else seven, six, four, two, two. So now I have a competition about among people who want to buy. Each person knows his own terms. Each person is trying to get it at a low price. Each person has their own maximum that they'd be willing to pay. Now to make this interesting, I'll start on the other side of the room and tell somebody, if you sell a unit, you can sell it. But if you sell that unit and you keep the money, anything you can get for it, but you're going to have to pay me $9 for it. So if you don't sell it, you pay me nothing. So my wife, Mariana, if you sell a unit, you can keep the money. Now this is something she understands completely. <laughs> but the part she doesn't understand is she has to pay me seven fifty. Somewhere else, six seventy, six thirty, etc. So now I have a series of sellers, each one who has a cost. 
I have a series of buyers, each one who has a Maximilian Pay. Now here's the question for you. Do you think that I could predict if we did this here, now, tonight with you, that I could predict the price that would emerge from the competition? That's the question. Could I predict who ends up buying and who ends up selling and their profits? That's the prediction. Could I actually predict how much money you as a group are going to take from me, the experimenter? Because some of you are getting money because I'm paying you, and others are paying money to me. So there's a wealth that I'm putting into your guys' hands. Can I actually predict the amount of that would be? All right. So you can see that that's really, a, a really an amazing question. If I polled you a little bit and embarrassed you by giving me theories, you'd find out there's as many answers to that quest, those questions as there are people in this room. Now let me show you how the simple little economics would work. Simple economics says, I'm going to do something that's rather dumb. I'm going to assume that there's a person who calls out a price. And if that person called out the price, say $9.99, there are two people that want to buy, this person and this person. If that person called out a price of $7.99, I have three people that want to buy. At $6.99, I have four people that want to buy. Well, let's see. At $9.99, how many people would I have that want to sell? Well, he would sell. They would, all these people would sell. So at $9.99, I have two people that want to buy. I have whatever this is. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight people that want to sell. The hypothesis is that the price will not be $9.99. All right? That's just a hypothesis. In fact, it says to solve this problem, you do something kind of odd. You say at $9.99, what would be the amount that people would take? At every possible price, ask how many the people would take. Now, this is actually kind of a complex thing. I'm inverting a function. I'm summing it. I'm not taking Fourier transform. I'm not doing anything complex. I'm just adding. And I'm creating out of my own imagination this curve. Now, economists will call that a man curve. What about the supply side? Well, at a price of 160, I have one person in the cell. At 261, two. You can see, basically, I'm creating another curve. Just out of my pure imagination. I'm defining these. Now, here's the amazing thing. The law of supply and demand says that somehow the system is going to find the solution to these two equations. It's a mathematical problem. It's not an ambiguous problem. It says this price will be that price. All of these guys will sell, buy, all these guys will sell, and the, this integral here, for those of you who like the mathematics, this integral area here is the amount of money they'll take from me, and it's a quantity. Everything here is measurable and observable. So I could actually do this little experiment, and we could find out whether it works or not. Right? So now you begin to see how the theory itself is exceptionally, frighteningly precise. It's not an arbitrary theory. It's not hand waving. It's saying something very precise. Furthermore, I can actually conduct this experiment and see, as a matter of fact, whether it works. Right? So now we have, the, we have the possibility of an experiment I could conduct this experiment and actually reject a law of supply and demand that's been around since Adam Smith almost 200 and something years ago. Well, that's what Bernard Smith did many years ago. He was teaching and he had nothing else to do. So he figured out a little way that he could give these receipts, these incentives, just as I told you, to his students. He has a demand and supply. He actually then let these guys start trading, yelling out, bidding, and asking, and here's the prices he saw. Here's a price, another price, another price, another price. He gets a volume of five. His model is predicting a volume of six. And Vernon in his class had more class time than this took. So he says, let's do it again, which he did. He did it again with them, and this is what happens. He did it again with them, and look what he observes. He observes it converging to the equilibrium. He's stunned. He has no idea why. No one thought it would work. And you can see our volumes are seven, six, seven, five. That's not bad for models. I'm around an engineering school, and that's certainly as accurate as engineers expect their models to be. So it's pretty good, right? Certainly for anything so ex exceptionally complex as this is. 
This is really complex. These are people I don't know anything about. I don't know their backgrounds. I don't know their sex. I don't know anything. Yet, other than they're human. And they're going to do this. Now, by the way, just parenthetically, if I did this with seven-year-olds or eight-year-olds, I will see data that looks no different than I did <coughs> if I did it with PhDs. Culture is going to make no difference. Sex is going to make no difference. This is going to be a phenomenon that's absolutely quite general. It's been tested thousands of times. About any question you could ask, it's been asked. Right? This works. Now, Vernon didn't believe it, so he says maybe it was the shapes. So he does this, very flat demand curve, this kind of supply curve. You can see it screaming up in this sawtooth thing. Now we know a lot about these paths and how it works, but again, it's just convergent. Vernon does this over and over and over again with many different parameters because he doesn't believe it. He walks away with this saying, wow, this works. Now here's one I did. This particular one has about 100 participants. They're located all over the world. This is the demand curve. I mean, this is the equilibrium. We'll run it, lots of variance. The variance goes out. You'll see it converging down. It sticks there for a little bit. We change the parameters, immediately swoops up, and then we change them back. And you can see how the demand and supply in a very large experiment throughout the world uh, is going to work using the same techniques. So this is, again, now you should be getting a, the idea that, wow, this is kind of amazing. I can take this simple little simultaneous equation model and it works quite well. Now I'm going to introduce you to something called JAWS. I came here because I heard that New Zealand was a good place to fish. So we're <laughs> going to introduce you to a fish called JAWS. Let's go back to this demand and supply. Remember the demand curve and the supply curve? When the trading takes place, it just these guys trade. And after the trading stops, you have all these guys that wanted to get in, and these guys, these sellers, and these guys are buyers who are excluded. I'm going to tell you that the shape <coughs> of this creature looks like jaws. When the upper jaw swings back and the lower jaw juts out, the price is going to go up. If the upper jaw swings down and the lower jaw swings back, the price is going down. In other words, the information about where this market is going to go is not unpredictable like you might have heard somewhere. It's extremely predictable. And it's predictable, the information is coming back in through this, this effort here. So let me show you again what you're going to see. This is going to be a time series. There are the trades. This is the equilibrium out of the mathematics. At any instant in time, there's the land, the price price is in here. This is, if I come up a little higher, this is how many offers there are to, to sell. Come up a little higher, this is how many offers there are to sell. If I go down, this curve shows how many offers there are to buy at an instant in time. This is going to be called the upper jaw. This is going to be called the lower jaw. This is the tongue, which is just halfway between them. This is how long an order has been in the book. I'm going to call this mask the mustache. This is how long the order has been in the book. This is the beard. So I'm going to have an upper jaw, a lower jaw, a tongue, a mustache, and a beard. And we're going to see the trail that the, the fish leaves after it eats. Okay? Those are the time series. Okay? So here's what we'll be seeing. The time series, the upper jaw, this is actually a shot of the data we're going to see, the lower jaw, the tongue, which is just halfway between these two. At any point in time, we see its droppings. We're going to see the upper jaw, the lower jaw, and the thing I'm going to show that you see, as a matter of fact, the shapes of these jaws is going to tell you which way the trade is going to be. Now that's going to mean that if you're at the floor of the market, watching the order flow, you're there. Within just a few minutes, you're going to know what the market's going to do. So the information is going to be very local. In other words, sitting back here a day or two days after the market, a little late, guys, we're going to be talking about information that exists as a matter of maybe 30 seconds, no longer than, say, five minutes. It's like that. Okay? So let me show you. Um, this is an experiment. Okay, there he is, there's Jaws. 
Now you're watching him move. This is the equilibrium. That's two hours. Okay. That's the time series. That might remind you of what your portfolio looks like almost every day as you watch it very closely. It seems to be up and down and jiggling around. It seems to be very random. But as you watch this, you're going to find out that this randomness you see here is very close to the theoretical equilibrium. That's two hours, and this experiment is going to be about two days long. Uh, and again, the people are all over the country. This is the upper jaw. This is the cell orders that are in the book, in Cydia. This is the lower jaw. And as you can see here, the tongue is kind of shaping down. It's hard to see which way this is going to go. But as you watch, watch the jaws, and you'll, be, you'll see that the jaws are telling you which way the market's getting ready to go. Just watch it. Your intuition will show it to you. So as the lower jaw builds up, price goes up. As the upper jaw builds up, price goes down. So you're actually watching a very fast playback of an extremely complex stochastic process. But you can see that the information is right there. Now you're beginning to see for yourself how it is that a market can find this equilibrium, this system of equations, the solution to the system of equations. It's really pretty amazing that we can see it like this. Now, as we move on here, the price is getting ready to go up. I'm going to shift up the demand to supply curve. It's an experiment. After all, I can do that. And you're going to get to see the market in this equilibrium. Now the price should be high, up there at the golden curve. Let's just stop. The price should be here, it's down here. You're actually seeing a market in disequilibrium. So if you're a finance guy, and you assume that markets are always in equilibrium as our models do, got bad news for you guys. That assumption itself is not so hot because we can actually see disequilibrium in these markets. And so when you see enough of cartosis and other things in the data, that could be the cause, all right? So that's just a little technical thing for the finance guys. Let's watch it. Now as we, we're getting more and more disequilibrium, now we can see the lower jaw is really jutting down out. The upper jaw is almost, dis and if you were there at the market, a trader, you would know it. You'd feel it. Now as the upper jaw is gone, and we're just seeing the lower jaw, now let's watch him recover. He's not going just any arbitrary place. He's going to an equilibrium. Okay? Now you're seeing something actually that's quite profound. You're actually getting to see what humans, other than a few people who've been able to watch this time series, have never been able to watch. You're actually watching the time series and the structure of how this complex nature of interactions equilibrates. Right? Now, like I said, you're I like fish. Now you can imagine a, a trout sitting down behind a, a rock. Now this trout actually is pretty smart. He'll sit there and he's looking ahead and he's watching a fly come down the stream. Right? And he's not sitting in the fast water, he's at the slow water. As the fly comes across, he'll move out in an energy minimizing way and get the fly and come back down. If he sees another trout approaching that fly, he moves a lot faster. So not only is he a good engineer in terms of minimizing energy, he's smart as a competitor. He's kind of like a businessman who actually knows how to capture the customer. He knows his business. He knows his business better than anyone else. Like that trout could probably do a better job of catching the flies and the best physicists in the world. This trout's really smart. But you know, the trout doesn't know what happens if it rains. It can't step on the back and watch the stream flow. It doesn't know what happens if there's a dam that goes in. To know those kinds of things, you have to step outside and see the structure of the system you're in. The trout can't do that like a businessman can't do that, like we can't do that. We're always in our little bitty circles. We know only the information that's around us. Now you're seeing something that, to me, is quite profound. We're able to sit back and see how a competition, this decentralized competition, works. Right? And so, you want to know what you learned from the experiment? If nothing else, what you just saw makes it worth the time. Right? But that's not all. We have other things. Let's keep going. Now, economics makes another, another statement. 
talks about informational efficiency. Now, what is that? Now, when you guys got up this morning and started reading the paper, you probably read, if you're watching the stock market, you probably read things like, well, you know, the euro really is rebounding because the Greeks seem to have gotten their act in order. Right? You read a story like that. You could have read something like, a local stock is doing something because an antitrust law has been, uh, been uh, launched. Basically, there's all these stories about what it is that's causing the market to go up and down. But you know, if you watch these stories, there's bits and pieces of truth that are coming into those things. We call those rational expectations. If you want to know what's going to happen to a market, watch the futures market. Because people who are in the know are actually trading in the futures market and that information that they have about the future is being brought to the present by the market. So that means that the markets can run around like a little vacuum sweeper, get these little bits and pieces of information, organize it as a statistician will, and publish it so you know what's happening. Now that's really an amazing story. In fact, it defies any kind of imagination that a market can do that while equilibrating. But, you know, again, like I've said, I'm a fisherman. And I'm not catching any fish. I'm out on the ocean. How do I catch fish? How do I find them? Come on. How do I find the fish? Sign up. Watch the other fishermen? I don't see any. What? What? How I guide, yeah. That's, that would be good. That's an economic answer. No. Any ideas? Look for the birds. You yeah, look for the birds, there's a fisherman. Now let's think about that. Let's think about that. This bird is watching other birds. And by the way, this bird has a brain about like that. He's watching other birds who are watching other birds who are watching little fish who are watching big fish. I'm sitting here in my boat and know where the big fish are that might be miles away without any communication whatsoever. Isn't that amazing? In other words, a system behavior is giving me the information just like a market can give you the information about what's happening. You're in a city and you don't know where to eat. How do you choose a restaurant? How do you choose a restaurant? Go to the busy one. What? Go to the busy one. The busy, busy one. Oh, the busy one, yeah. Now, what are you doing? You're saying, I think that that guy, those people, know something I don't know. I think that they're not stupid. So if they're not stupid and they know something I don't, I don't know, I can actually invert their decision rules and go back and retrieve what it is they know. It's a common sense thing that we do all the time. If you're in a committee room, now we have administrators here, you're in a, you're in a room and somebody has gone out to talk to an administrator. It could have been a bad day or a good day. When that person walks in the room, you know whether to ask or not. <laughs> right? How? Right? So that's what we're talking about. We're talking about very everyday common sense kinds of things. Now the question is, can a market do that and how? So let's listen to one or watch one. Okay, now we're going to have a little asset market here. This asset will pay either a high, I think that's four dollars or two dollars, with a fifty with a with a certain probability of this or this. This is the expected value of the asset. So on random, on average, it's going to pay this. So it's, this asset is going to last one period, only one period. Now, here's what's going to make it interesting. You're going to watch the bids and asks of the people trading. There may be an insider, and if there's insider, these insiders know whether it's a good in year or a bad year. Okay? So if there's insiders there, they know whether it's a good year or a bad year. Not everybody's an insider, just a few. There may be no insiders. Right? So your job is going to be guess is there an insider or not an insider? Right? Should you buy or should you sell? Now, of course, you're not insiders. So you don't know whether it's insiders or not. So let's listen to this. Okay, now what you're doing, you're listening to, those are, that's a trade. These high things are asked, and a high sound is a high. 
my bitter ask. A low sound is a low bitter ask. And there's the trays. Now this is the expected value, and right now there is no insider. Everyone knows there's no insider. It's just kind of rude. As soon as the next round starts, there may be an insider or there may not be an insider. Okay? So your job is to tell me is there an insider or not? Is it a good year or bad year? nothing to show. Your intuition would say, that is so obvious, come on. But it's not. If you start looking at the structure of the theory and what's going on here, this is an exceptionally complex problem. All right? So let's take a little more look. Yeah. Good year, bad year. Now notice that even now, after just a few seconds, just a few seconds, you're beginning to have an opinion. What do you think? Good year or bad year? Yeah, it's, it's so trivial, but it's not. You guys are knowing that in a matter of just a few bids and asks. And if I ask you, what are you processing, you cannot tell me. What is it you're listening to? Write it down in a mathematical way. You're not going to be able to. of this market is telling you to be careful, right? Not the bids and ads. Turns 
turns out that's a bubble. <laughs> that's not a good year, and there's no insider. Now, one of the things we're going to learn as we go through this lecture is that while the markets have these really powerful features, they can go wrong. Right? They could be misleading. And where the misleadingness takes place is in the nature of the subtle features of market organization. Right? In this particular market you're watching, we call it a double auction. The bids and asks come in in real time, and we know exactly how the information gets in. The information comes in in the bids and the asks early. So the first people in that market are the guys who know things, and you guys are picking up on that. Right? But in other institutions, we don't have that luxury. So we'll Okay, so that's the music, almost all your music you'll get to see. Let's go to another problem. Now let's look at this information problem again. This time, imagine yourself as getting ready to buy an asset. You're going to place a bid on it. All right? Now, you have your own private information about the value. The value here, for example, is 180. You then are going to do your research, and your research can have inaccuracies. I don't know if you're a businessman, you probably know that. You went in, you think you know something, and you think, whoops, that didn't work. Right? So there's some errors involved. In this particular case, your error can be the real plus or minus 30. So here, if your valuation says it's worth 165, you know for certain that it's 165 minus 30 or 165 plus 30. That's just the state of nature. Now just go along with me and assume that that's true without arguing why. It's, in this structure, it is true. Okay, so now let's suppose that you, you had a, a value, your personal value of 165. You don't know what the true value is, but you know the range. What would you bid? You're trying to make money. What would you bid? So let's go through a couple of exercises and challenge it. In this case, you think the value is 100, but you know that you might have an error. So your error says it could be as low as 70, it could be as high as 130. So, but you're, on average, it's 100. You're watching somebody bid, say our bid was 90, and he's bidding against two other people. Now here's the question. Do you think we should bid more or less? Think about that. Should we bid more or less? Well, how many think we should bid more? Come on, you got to play the game. How many think you should bid less? Okay? Now, as you notice, there's a difference of opinion. That's fine. So let's see what happens. Well, the winning bid was 100. The true value was only 85. I want you to notice that the person who won lost money. He paid 100 for it. The value was 85. Bid too much. Let's try it again. Our signal, our, our information says it's 136. That means we know it's either 106 or 166. Our guy bids 126. Should he bid more or less? How many more? How many less? Okay. You guys are getting into it. That's good. The, uh, I know that people in the southern hemisphere actually watch auctions a little bit. So you might have had this experience, right? Well, let's see what happens. Well, the winning bid was 160. We were certainly outbid. But the actual value was only 160. So this guy didn't lose money, but he certainly didn't make any. Let's try it again. Our value says it's 158. So we know for sure it's between 128 and 188. The guy we're watching bids 148. Should he bid more or less? Any ideas? Well, let's see what happened. Well, the winner bid 175, outbid us, but the actual value was 173, so we noticed the winner actually lost money. Right. So now notice that we have one, first winner lost, second winner nothing, third winner loses. Let's do another one. 
Our value is 182. So we know it's between 152 and 212. Our, bid by, our guy bids 162. Should he bid more or less? How many think less? How many think more? Okay. By the way, notice that most of you think more. The true value is 162. The, I mean, the, we, our bid won at 162. The true value is 156. In other words, you guys did exactly the same thing that all the guys who did who came in front of you. It's called the winner's curse. Right? The winner in this type of situation almost always loses money. It's in the structure of the institutions. Right? Now, if and let me give you an intuition. If you bid the highest, it's more likely that you had the high signal. But if you have the high signal, it means the truth is down here. So if you win, that means that you're a, you have an extreme signal. You do not want to win if you had an extreme signal. So it's in the structure of the institutions that designs it such that the winner will lose. Now let me tell you something really fascinating. Why isn't it that we didn't see losing in the one we heard? It's because in that one you saw the bids and asks coming in. If we change this auction so it was an ascending price auction so we could see the bids and asks, this phenomenon goes away. So now you begin to see that by studying these things in detail, we can see that very slight changes in the way it's organized makes major differences. Right. So that's the next thing we learn is that Slight changes in the way we organize ourselves are important. Okay, now let me show you how this is used, these kind of ideas of information and information aggregation. If I know the principles that are evolving, I might be able to design systems that do nothing other than collect information from people that I want to know about something specific that I think they know collectively something about and use it. It's not a regular market. It's a market designed for the purpose of collecting certain types of information that I can't get in any other way. What am I doing? I'm going to be able to use their kind of betting this greediness to show me which restaurant is the best. Right? I just have to design it right to know what they know. And so here's the way that works. This is an actual example that took place in test inside a unit pecker. Uh, we want to know what are going to be the sales of a particular computer we we'll call low. We're going to divide the, the, the range of possible sales into 1,500 to 1,600. Uh, I mean, 0 to 1,500, 1,500 to 1,600, 1,600 to 1,700. So I've just sliced the possibilities up. Then I'm going to create, for each one of these possibilities, I'm going to create a market. If you buy this security called September Low, 0 to 1500, and if that turns out to be the actual sales, every unit you buy pays a dollar. If you buy this security called Low, 1500 to 1600, every unit, and if that turns out to be the truth, the actual level of sales, Every unit of that pays a dollar. So now you can see now that for every possibility, I've created a very special security that pays a dollar if that's the possibility. For those finance guys, you'll see this is a kind of options. It's a class of options. Now notice that the price, if everybody knows that this is going to be the sales, everyone would buy that security and the price would be a dollar. The price of all, everything else would be zero. Let's suppose there's disagreements of, of opinion. Then this price here is going to be between 1 and 0, and that's going to be a probability. Since the price is between 0 and 1, I can actually look at these prices as probabilities, and now we have a really interesting question. Do these probabilities actually predict what's going to happen inside of HP sales that no one knows? Well, we did this 17 times or 18 times. We always beat HP's official forecast. 
We've had one of these going now in, inside Intel for four years. They started with one market, now they're dealing with hundreds of markets, dealing with this, trying to get the information that are remotely located out in the organization that they really can't get in other ways. You want to know what the major movies are going to box office going to be? We can do that with upcoming box offices. As a matter of fact, the United States, they're now debating creating a movie's futures where the capital can go into the movies industry based upon estimates of future box offices. And this kind of technology is key to the way it's going to be developed. So now you begin to see that not only do these kind of weird things have a structure, they have consequences. So let me show you some others. That's just these key things. Okay, now, let's talk about instability. Let's suppose that here's a parking lot, here's one parking place, and here's another parking place. You have a big van, you need two parking places. You're willing to pay $100 for the pair. Okay? If you buy one and don't have the other, you lost the money. Now you have another guy who wants a single parking place. He's willing to pay $75 for either one, and he doesn't care which one. So now let's do a little bidding against this guy, and of course you want to get the two parking places. So let's see what happens. Whoops. Okay, you being wise, you bid very low, trying to get them at a bargain. You bid on the other one, now you've got them both. That's great. Except, the auction's not over. And this guy comes in and beats you. Right? So now you have this one, but you don't have that one. If you don't come back and beat him, you're going to lose your money on that one, because it's worthless to you. No after work. So you knock him out. Now you got them both. What does he do? He jumps on the other one. Right? What do you do? You knock him out. You've got them both. What does he do? He comes back on this one. What do you do? You knock him out, bidding the maximum you'd be willing to pay. Now you're at 50, and it's, these things are worth no more than 50 each to you. What does he do? He knocks you out on this one. So what do you do? You come back, and you knock him out. Now you bid 50 on each of them. That's the maximum you're willing to pay. What does he do? He knocks you out. What do you do? You either come back, and you don't know how, or you're going to lose your money here. What should we do? How many would say, let's stick it out? How many say it's fold and go home? Right. If you fold and go home, you realize you're losing that money. Okay, that's for sure. You guys begin to feel the problem, right? This is a problem that's basically inherent in many problem, policy problems. And you have to be very careful because the way that economies, we organize markets can lead to weird stuff. Let's just see what happens. If you stick with him, whoops. Okay, you knock him out. He comes back and bids a max. You buy bid him out. Well, as it turns out, you get them both, but you bid more, a lot more than you would be willing to. So you got them both. It went. The allocation was efficient in an economist sense, but it also the winner lost money. Not a happy circumstance if you're doing this for the government, for example. Now, what's going on here? This is a case that economists call confluence. It's like left shoes and right shoes. I want a pair, or I want nothing. So in an economics jargon, this is also, we call this a non-convex problem. So it's really bad. It's not only do we have non-convexity, so our classical equilibrium does not exist, by the way, back to technical stuff. When I said it's a technical discussion, this comes right out of theory, by the way. This isn't a play pretty. The, uh, so it's a technical, the equilibrium doesn't exist. 
Furthermore, in this type of case where you have complements, you can have an unstable market. The market can really do weird things. Okay? And of course, we study those. How do you solve this problem? Well, we don't have time to see. Well, we try. You solve it by what we call a combinatorial auction. So you don't bid on a thing at a time, say like in your house you bid here and then you bid on another house in sequence. We're going to open up all the markets simultaneously, all. So at any instant time you can bid on one, if the price goes up you can say screw that, I'm going to go over another one, right? So they can switch back and forth as the auction goes on and we, there's rules for stopping it. Or I can bid on sets. So I can say, I want this only if I get that. I want this, 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 and that as a set. How do you do that? Well, you, the technology here is going to allow it because to bid on a set, I just punch in the set I want, hopefully, I'm, and it's going to appear over here, right? So here's a guy, number 72, who wants a big set. You can see the blue. He's bid on a big, number 71, wants a set. Anytime you send in a bid for a set, this system is going to look through all permutations and combinations that you might be able to fit. And if it can make more money for the seller, it's going to do it. Now to give you a feeling for this, you're seeing one here with about 80 or 90 options. There's probably on the order of 200 bids in the system. To solve that problem, it's 2 to the 200th power. 2 to the 200th power. That's many times more grains of sand than there are in the universe, probably. Certainly in the world. This is a huge number. You'll solve it like that. Instantaneous, fractions of seconds. What you're hearing now is it's possible using the technologies to create markets that one would think could not conceivably be created just a few years ago. Right? Why? Because now we can solve these excruciatingly complex problems and do it instantaneously. And furthermore, the bidders don't have to be in the same room. They can be anywhere in the world, participating in this in real time. Now, the one I'm, I have to show you, and we don't really have time to see it, the one I show you, would could show you, is an auction that we just finished offshore in Melbourne, selling uh, offshore fish farms for mussels. The, the fish farmers, actually, the, the government of, uh, of Victoria, has decided that we wanted to, to, to let the private sector handle the water. There's two things it could have done. It could have gone through a legal way or a political way. Uh, they said, wow, that takes years. Uh, it's very controversial. Let's auction it off. That's great. How? So they used this system here to auction that off. Uh, and the fish farmers, by the way, they don't want a farm. They want portfolios of farms. I don't want them close together because of diseases and currents and, and winds. I want them located in a way that's optimal for me. But now we have a finite number of farms and people want different portfolios of these farms. How do you do that? Uh, we did this and it took about uh, two hours. Now something like this is going to be used again in, in Victoria for allocating uh, for basically natural, uh, natural grass if you destroy natural grass in Victoria. You've got to replace it with comparable grass somewhere in Victoria and leave it in, in a, a preservation forever. How do you do that? Now it takes collections of farmers and collections of buyers to get one of these things going. So this is exactly the type of process that they're going to be using. It's an ongoing exchange. And again, you're seeing where something is emerging out of the very basic science into a serious application. Of course, they're thinking about this in carbon markets and other kinds of things. So this is a non, this is a non-dead issue for this kind of market. Okay, this is this is this is again to show you how that works, but I'm not going to. Okay, so we started this out. Said, uh, will economics become a laboratory experimental science? Yeah, it did. It's been that way for quite a while. In fact, on the on the right, we're going to see all types of things and this is just within the last three or four years where we're seeing applications pop up. Can it produce an industry? It already has. 
So the combinatorial markets you just saw, these are popping up everywhere. <coughs> the information aggregation markets, there's whole societies dealing with that now. Uh, stability and related things are, are popping up in litigation. Uh, and certainly we're seeing lots in, uh, in uh, auction design, environmental instruments, development of public enterprises, new forms of competition, because now we know how to create competition in a different way. Uh, information aggregations, stability, marketing, transportation, logistics. How do you allocate rights, private rights to use public railways? If you think about it, it's got all the problems. Can it be a foundation of for It is. So basically what we've seen, which is kind of exciting, we've seen this basic research in economics that started a few years ago begin to mushroom into to applications. And of course I'm at Caltech, I cannot avoid comparing myself to my competitors in the, in the physical sciences and the biological sciences. The comparison I like to make is, my lab was really cheap, <laughs> really cheap relative to your lab. <laughs> what have you done for the world? Well, you know, I can pick any of these things and see that the, the consequences of our, our, our little research has resulted in billions of dollars. They tested the FCC uh, uh, license out uh, in my lab, for gosh sakes. Uh, landing rights, billions of dollars. How did you guys do on that school? school? <laughs> What's the time? What's the time from basic discovery to application? We're talking about just a few years here, not 15, 20, 30 years the way we see in the natural sciences. So my argument has been, in case there's somebody who is interested in giving money, <laughs> these are really, really, really productive things by way of where science has been and where science has gone. And relative to the other sciences, we're seeing new science it's beginning to merge in an exciting way. Now, I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying that everything is, is successful, uh, but it's, it's there, it's real. So I'm gonna leave you that with that. Um, I'll do one more thing, hopefully. Let's go back to this. if I know how to do it. Okay. Let's play stock market. We're going to, we're going to watch the value of buying and selling an asset that pays, a, that has a 15 period life. Okay? Each period it pays a random dividend that's going to be 0, 8 cents, 28 cents, or 60 cents. Okay? It's an expected value of something like 26 or 28 cents. It has a 15 period life, so when it starts, its fundamental value is $3.60 here. Each period of its life it'll pay a dividend, so here it would be just 14 periods left, 13 periods left, so its fundamental value falls with time just like I'm telling you, and everybody who's going to be participating in this market knows it. Let's suppose that it paid zero, and you knew for sure. This lower bound would be here, zero price. Let's suppose it would pay its maximum possible, 60 cents per period. Well, then its fundamental value would be up here starting at $9 over 15 periods and come down. So if it's out here, we know it's impossible, and everyone knows it's impossible, because it assumes that this thing will pay dividends it cannot pay, right? So now we're going to start the buying and selling just like we saw earlier. And again, just like earlier, that's an ask, that's a typo. And we're watching the buys and sells, variance of, now the expected value is right here. That's the fundamental value that everybody knows. We see it's a little low. Fundamental value. So let's watch it. More typos. It's paying the dividend here. 
Now notice that the value is a little bit above its fundamentals. So we're watching for sure, we're watching the bubble. The price is higher than the fundamental value. You see variance is kind of low. Now, if you walk out of this room, someone will say, as he buys, why are those fools buying? The price is too high. He'll say, as he buys. Because if I can buy and collect the dividend and sell back to this fool for the same price, I've got the dividend for nothing. Now, hear that little chime that you just heard? Everyone knows that this market is in a bubble. When a market starts getting nervous, you'll hear bids and asks, unlike the others. It's a very asymmetry of the kurtosis back in the lower end of this range. You'll hear something else. That was probably the typo. That's not. That's not. I watch these. unstable points, which is just one, is instantaneous. The only guys that might get out are the guys that are at the location at the second who are basically seeing the order flow come in. Otherwise, you're cooked. And I'll leave you with that. Thank you very much. <laughs> Position. Um, it was as good as, uh, as good as anything I could possibly have expected. Um, when Marsh and Steve, a couple of years ago, told me that experimental economics was the future and we should invest in staff and uh, lab, I'm glad I took their advice. <laughs> um, so that was great. Now, um, Charlie said he's got a couple of notes. We're going to take some general questions. We have got drinks and refreshments at the back where we can continue the discussion informally. But if anybody has some burning issues they'd like to, to address in open forum, uh, we're happy to take a, a couple of these. Sorry, I'm not sure, but did we actually determine uh, when there was an insider as opposed to when there wasn't one? I'm, I'm sorry. You know, I, you know, the thing I've discovered okay. is that as I get older, people talk softer. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I don't know what that phenomenon is, but it certainly does seem to be it. It's either that or the accident. Go ahead. Sorry, did we determine when there was an insider and when there wasn't one? Because I might have missed that detail. This one. The question is, how do you do that? Well, weren't we trying to pay attention to whether we saw an insider or not? And uh, when did we see one? Well, here is random. These, is random just, these were just pure random. And the previous one? Pure random. Oh, this? 
Uh, this one here was, this one here, this type of bubble comes from the asset, the time structure of it. So this is unlike the other. The other one, you were picking up signals that were wrong. Now we know when the information comes in the market, it comes in with a structure. The guys who are most passionate, who know the, the stuff first best, are the first guys there. They tender bids and asks. So if you're watching it closely, you actually realize that the first information, the first actions that occur in the market, 30 seconds, no more than a minute, is actually very, very good information. And so that's the way that occurs. Now, if the wrong guys get in there, those guys who know nothing, they mislead the whole market. And so, boom, off it'll go into the bubbles you saw. This is a different kind of phenomenon. It has to do with the time structure. And so once I see, if you see back over in the, the early part where it's too high, now I know I'm in a market with idiots. So I'm going to take advantage of the idiots. Now, of course, everybody's in the same boat. There are no idiots in these markets. That's just a natural part of structure. So if it ever gets up there and you're con convinced and people are convinced they're in a market with crazies, then they all act like that, and you get this kind of phenomenon. And typically, it has to do with the fact that I could buy and resell the guy. I think I'm smarter than. So that's that's what's driving this one. We think. We think. Okay. 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 But if I mean, just just one question: If you model that without a finite life, so so it's an infinite life, infinite life yeah. version of that. And it gets out of its equilibrium. Is there any way of predicting when it will make that adjustment? You know, since I understand your exalted position in this university, <laughs> <laughs> I can just say that I can just say these are answerable questions if somebody would cough up the money. <laughs> but the, but the, uh, the answer is we've looked at that, and the way you do that is have a random variable that it goes on for a little bit. And these bubbles can, can persist quite a bit. And so there's a real question about uh, if it can persist, and as well as we know, these bubbles can persist for a long, long, long time. Now, what you can do is put futures markets in there. You can put certain kinds of options in there. As you can see, this kind of information here carries very powerful information. If you can change the market structure and get that out of there. But all these subtle things, we really and truly don't know. And so... Uh, the infinite life in your intuition is dead on according to the theory. According to the theory, it can go forever. So, but technically, is it necessary? Can we correct it? Can we make it pop? Uh, this is a, a bubble. If I have another asset that gives me information in a different time scale, will that one acting correctly cause this one to pop? Is it the case that the whole system is can be, be like I said, we have more research to do. Well, please join me in, in thanking Professor Potter for a fascinating talk and do stay with me.